Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for coming uh, uh, tonight. And I want to start really with the obvious. And if you don't notice it, then you've got real problems. You must have a TV or radio. But right now, over the last four weeks, a hurricane has swept through the world economic system. And you don't have to believe me about this. I'm going to quote you from, uh, I'm not sure if it's called Hank or Henry. Every paper puts him differently. It's Hank or Henry Paulson, the architect of Bush's $800 billion bailout. He said this afternoon, or this morning in America, we have just days to stop the economy going into cardiac arrest. And that's quite serious terms, uh, if you want my opinion. Uh, cardiac arrest normally means your heart stops and you die. Yeah, exactly. So I think we're talking about, even they're a little bit worried about what's going on right now. And secondly, I think, I don't want to go into it, but literally in the terms of the banking system, billions have been wiped off shares. Thousands of workers already have lost their jobs, and the instability of the banking system is not just impacting the financial sector of the economy, but it's actually why it affecting the countries as well. I mean, if you read the papers today, it looks like Iceland is now going to be called Iceland PLC. The entire company, I mean, the, the bank assets, they've got 10 times as much debt as they have got money in their entire country, and the government are now completely panicking and it looks like they might have to sell them off to the Chinese. So it's going to be an interesting system, and if you think it's bad, Enough for country, and Iceland's tiny, Iceland's the same population as Bristol, I think. But if you want to think of it in another terms, they're now talking about the Euro may no longer exist. They are talking about, in terms of third world countries, it's not even a question of mass unemployment and financial ruin. You're talking about millions and millions of, uh, of people starving and tens and hundreds of thousands dying. Just two statistics I picked up today. First of all is this, just a couple of anecdotes more than anything else, is the cost of platinum has fallen by 50% in the last four weeks. That has what, no, it's not good news at all. It's not good news because platinum is used by the car industry, which means that the car industry is no longer buying it, which means that tens of thousands of people in South and the Southern African states will go on to the dole, when it, for them it won't be a question of having low money. For those that will not have enough, enough money to, in places like Namibia and South Africa, not enough money to buy rice to feed themselves and they will die. So it's a crisis that goes right to the very bottom. Again, this is the United Nations estimate themselves, <laughs> That all the gains of the debt relief that came from Glen Eagles, remember when Blair told everyone yep. that world famine was over, that we've solved the debt crisis, that's been wiped out. That entire money has been wiped out in the last four weeks alone. So that's that for the, for the poorest people. I suppose the question is, when's it going to end? And I'm a great believer in the Financial Times. I read the Financial Times avidly at the moment. I love it. I read it every single day properly. I just thought I'd look through the editorials of the Financial Times and see when they think it's going to end. This is what they said over Northern Rock. Thankfully, Northern Rock is an anomaly in the UK banking system. There is little evidence that this will spread to other sectors of the financial economy. It's not very good there. Then the AIG bailout, next day. This is a huge gamble for the US government, but their audacity has paid off. The panic is receding and the markets are now calm. And this is what they said after the £700 billion Paulson bailout. The worst is now over. So, I don't think they know, quite frankly. And if you look at today, you see in Britain, again, Darling's announcement. I don't know if people know that Darling didn't go to sleep last night. He stayed up all the way through the night doing the deal with the CBI. That he told us it was only going to, it was going to cost £50 billion. Pounds. It's now come out this afternoon that the actual cost of, uh, of, of his bailout is £500 billion. That's on the front page of the light tonight. £500 billion. Pounds. And just to put it into some perspective, that is £20,000 for every single taxpayer in this country. So they are in real, real trouble uh, right now. They do not know when it's going to end. And I think we have to start this meeting with understanding. There's a lot of arguments that people say the ruling class don't know what they're doing. They don't have a plan. You see, they have a plan, but the plan changes. And it's just worth spelling it out a little bit for, for, for me, if you like. Because on the 7th of September, and I think it's important for every student in the, class, in the room here, every worker in the room, on the 7th of September, the most right-wing Republican administration for, in the US for at least three quarters of a century, we can debate this question, but really it's irrelevant. They are vicious right-wing thugs in the, in the Bush admin, in administration, carried out the greatest nationalisation in the history of humanity when they uh, saved the mortgage giants Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And I saw this wonderful Republican guy, uh, senator come out and say, we should be called the USS of a United Socialist States of America. That's what the Republicans panic was about. It is bigger than anything Chavez or Bolivian government would ever dream to do. Seven days later, 
That same administration broke with a pattern of three quarters of a century and allowed the big one of the third biggest financial institution in America, the Lehman Brothers, to go to the wall. I must, I must have wondered what the Lehman Brothers managers must have thought. How come they can save these poor bastards, but they can't save us? What did we do wrong for them? The very next day, the government bailed out AIG, the world's biggest insurance company. You see, I think it's important to see that. Not in terms of they don't have a plan. They have a plan, but their plans are being buffeted every single day. You feel every time you write anything, three hours later, it's completely out of date. I remember Charlie Kimber, the day before Black Monday, we had a party meeting in London, and he said, you know, our perspective only lasts as probably as long as this meeting. And I don't think he knew what was going to happen the next day, but literally, Black Monday took place. You feel, you write something, and by, you know, I was writing on Monday morning party notes, our little notes to my members. We'll be writing out saying, that the financial sector looks like it's calmed down. At eight o'clock in the morning, they were saying it's Shares are going up. Ten to nine, I look on BBC Google and it's they're going right down again. You know, all right, change it again. It's almost impossible to keep up. And the whole system is up. And I want to say this because I think the crisis is immense and we can end up speculating how deep it's going to go. Is it going to be like 1929? Is it going to be worse than 1929? Are they going to get out? For me, all we need to know right now is it's getting worse, it's getting worse every single day. And they are in panic and they are opening up big problems. We've got to do it. And I'll tell you something else that really makes me sick is that little scumbag, Richard Littlejohn. I don't know if anyone saw him on the radio the other day. He turned around and said, this crisis is not going to affect working class people. In fact, all it will do is if you support West Ham, it just means that your team won't be sponsored by anybody. That was his, that's the only impact it's going to have on working class people. That man's always been a liar, in my, in my opinion. He's always been a scuzzbag. And I'll tell you what, the truth is a complete lie. Because already, even at the beginnings of this crisis, we're beginning to see how it's affecting ordinary working class people in this country. Just look at the job losses in the last, in the last week. They claim that 50,000 jobs have gone since the last four weeks in the financial sector of the banking system. Do you know what makes me sick? That the government don't even bother to record the jobs in cleaning, in the shops, because they don't think they're worthy of noting their jobs. But nevertheless, if 50,000 people have lost their jobs in the city, that will have an impact on the lowest and poorest workers in the economy, those who clean their offices, those that uh, carry out the canteens, those that do the coffee shops, the faceless, the ghost workers of our society. Amazon have just laid off 1,000 workers. IEN have just laid off 1,200 workers. Ford Southampton is on a four day a week. This is like life on Mars stuff. This is like going back to the 1970s. It feels like you're going back in time and you're seeing all the things that, uh, that have gone. And for me, this is a crisis of basic necessities, necessities for working class people, of food, shelter and fuel. And I'll tell you what, when they predict we have unemployment which will reach 2 million by Christmas, that will reach 4 million by the end of 2009, I want people to cut anyone old enough in this room, cast your minds back to what it was like in the 80s under Thatcher when they had the big doll queues. The front of this week's socialist work that kind of harks back to that era. Go back to when it was at 3 million. When you had boys from the black stuff, when you had the miners strike, when you had the bitterness of Thatcher, when you had you know, all the programmes that just made you despair about living in Thatcher's Britain, the unemployment workers centres open up and stuff. That was 3 million. They're predicting 4 million in uh, a, 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 year, a, a, a year's time. I'll tell you something else about it. This is something for all you people who've been saving your pensions for the, all your lives. On Friday, before Black Monday, the pensions deficit stood at £28 billion. Pounds. Two, a week ago, it stood at £42 billion. Pounds, and the TUC reported today that it now stands at £52 billion pound deficit. They're saying that at least 25% of all pensions will be wiped off. People, working people, are paid in their pensions for year after year after year, and they're just talking about taking 25% away from it. And they already tell the pensioners they're not going to get their windfall, windfall tax and all the rest of it. And it seems to me that far from it just being a, a crisis of the finance sector, this is a crisis that's going to impact directly into the real economy, into jobs in, in manufacturing, in servicing, and in the white collar, uh, collar sector. It's going to rip the heart through, through, through that. And therefore it seems to me that this is a crisis that affects us on three, three levels. The first is ideological. And it seems to me... Have a drink. It seems to me... It's a real drink. Um, there's a great joke by Frank Sinatra. He once said, uh, the people who don't drink alcohol, you know, your life gets really bad. And, uh, you know, when you wake up in the morning, the reason it's so bad is because that's the best it's going to get. And I always feel that about Coke. You always have a little Coke and call it better for it. So <laughs> For the last three decades, we've had these Thatcherite, Majorite, Blairite, 
bloody Bushite, Reaganite, economics just fuss down our folks. That the market is the logical system, that it's the only solution, that only free market capitalism is the way to run the world, that it's dog eat dog, you've got to have rich, you've got to have poor, you've got to have winners, you've got to have losers, you've got to have go-getters, and you've got to have people who just do the crap jobs in, in life. They keep ramming it down our folks. And I'll tell you what makes me sick, and I'll tell you I'm glad when the Daily Mirror runs a front page of that bloke who runs Lehman Brothers and calls him a greedy pig. I'm glad, because the man is a greedy pig. This man is involved in sacking 25,000 workers and he awarded himself, I'll get the figure right, £11 million for nine months' work. £11 million for sacking 25,000 people. Anyone, anyone can do that. I could sack 25,000 people easy for £11 million. It's not a difficult thing to do. You just say you're fired. We see those programmes doing it. It's not a difficult thing uh, uh, to do. And I'll tell you, I think there is a real gut-wrenching thing that these people are ripping these... I like the term spibs and thieves and crooks because they are the real crooks. And last Saturday, I was in my local coffee shop and I saw the most wonderful sign. And the sign said this, only two suits allowed in this coffee shop at any one time. <laughs> I'll tell you why that's important. Because for me, it's about what's going on right now is people are beginning to question everything. From the really small thing, the, the idea you turn in logic on it said the logic is that our kids are the problem. And even coffee shop owners, it's not the kids with that suppose that are the problem. The real problem are these spibs and hooligans and capitalists and bosses who are ripping us off and the government don't seem to care to do nothing about it or other ones when it's important. I think we ought to say one more thing as socialists. It's not just the finance sector that are spivs and crooks. Alan Layton is a crook. He's a man who runs Royal Mail. And I'll tell you why he's the biggest crook, because he's one of the richest and well-paid bosses <coughs> in the world. And I've said this joke before, but I think it's worth saying. This man, last year when there was a post office strike, told everybody, told everyone that he'd had enough of the strike, he weren't going to put up with it anymore, and if they didn't go back to work, those post workers, he was going to do their job for them. That's what he said to people. I'm going to deliver the mail. Now I've got to my little calculator out and worked it out. There are 180,000 post workers deliver our mail every day. If bloody Alan Layton worked for seven days a week, 364 days a year, it would take him 280 years to deliver one day's mail. So let him go and deliver the mail if he wants to. Of course, he makes the money, all the money, but without ordinary people, they wouldn't be able to deliver the mail in this country. And I think we have to understand, we don't just pick on the bankers. It's also about people saying, actually, the real crooks are the people that run our businesses, extract people's profits out of them, extract their labour power and ruin it and destroy their lives and are willing to switch the switch off whenever it suits them, uh, all, 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 all the rest of it. I'll tell you something else I want to say. You can see how nasty it's going to get. You're not going to be able to see this at the back, right? But let me just show you what's gone up in Liverpool today. This is a picture. Sutton Estates Agent. And they put these on all the homes, all the homes in the streets of Liverpool. Rent dodger lives here. Oh. This is Sutton Estate agents. They think it's perfectly all right under capitalist crisis when they are the ones that have already put prime, you know, market mortgages out, put the people that market up the hoop, cut council houses, denied people the right to live anywhere, forced them to buy places they can't afford. Then they turn around when they can't afford to pay their mortgages, all their debts, all their rents, and put out here rent dodgers live here. I tell you what. If I was in Liverpool right now, I'd go down that bloody street, I'd pull those signs out, I'd put them in the road and I'd burn them. I think it's about time we start to say this to these people. We're not going to have people just turning around and telling us that we are the real dodgers, we are the real criminals. The criminals are not in Liverpool in council houses or in these cheap or these expensive uh, mortgage estates. The people in the city, in the Bank of England, in Dan Downing Street, they're the ones that are ripping people off. And about time we got our own poster made, and I think we yeah, should get absolutely. one out. Actually, I've just thought of it. We should get one out tomorrow, and we should put them up in our, our, our thing. We know where the real rent dodgers live. They live in 10 Downing Street in the Bank of England and Lehman Brothers, and start naming names where they are. I want to say, I want to say something else. Because when you talk about that, it seems to me two great opportunities come. You see, if there's a huge ideological crisis about the way the system is, and the real question is people getting to question capitalism, it seems to me a really obvious thing. It seems to me that if you're a student or a worker, I'd go into my lecture or into my box and say, I'd like to do a five minute meeting and just talk about the system for one minute because we've had it thrust down our throat how great it is. I don't think it's that hot at the moment. And maybe I'd like to have a few words about capitalism and what's wrong with the system. I think we have to go on the ideological offensive on, 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 this, on this question. But I'll tell you what else is also because there's a debate. It seems to me that the neocons being really a run for cover. But there is the return to Keynesianism. 
And I think we're seeing that, really, in a, in a real world. The idea that instead of allowing free market forces to run rampant, you have the state, this more control of the state of the economy and all the rest of it. And again, I think there's a debate to be had there. I ain't got time to talk about it much in this meeting, but it seems to me there's two varieties of Keynesians out there at the moment. One is a right-wing variety, which really I think is an argument that they want to socialise, you know, socialise, defend the banks and buy them out to protect the profits of these multi-millionaires. And that's all they think they need to do. There's another group on the left, I would argue, who want to see state intervention to protect jobs other than just the question of the banks and the finance sector, but car industry, etc, uh, etc. Et in that debate, I really am for, absolutely for, with the left Keynesians versus the right ones. It seems to me to be absolutely common sense. Why should it be the question they can find billions to save the banking system, but they can't find millions to save our jobs. They're going to close 100, is it 100 or 1,000 post offices, Charlie? No. 1,000 post offices. All it's going to cost to save them is £134,000. But this government can't do that. But it can find, what is it, 500 billion to bail out the banks. You see, I spoke about, about six years ago at Longbridge, I spoke at a debate with the Labour MP and the convener, Steve, of Longbridge Car Plant. And I made a very, very simple slide with it. It cost three billion to save Longbridge. And when I spoke, I said, why can't the government find the money to bail out Longbridge? And that's the convener at the time got up and said, Martin, you're a utopian. This is Trotsky's fantasy world. <laughs> we, had a, we had an argument, to put it crudely. We had a, a bit of a fallout. We weren't that good friends for a long time. Two weeks ago, I was at a United Against Fascism demonstration in Stoke, and the Longbridge banner was there. And he came up to me, and he put his arm around me, and said, I'd like to apologise, because I thought you were a utopian. But i tell you something, when I look around now, and I can see the billions they can find for the banks, but they couldn't find it for me, I was wrong. I was wrong because it's wrong. And I just think there's lots of people out there thinking, hang on, there's not something quite wrong with a system that can find billions for the rich, that can find nothing at all for the poor in this system. And it seems to me that I'm for the argument of bailing out uh, our job, our other, our other workers, but I'm also for something else, because I'm not a doctor. You'll be glad to know this. I am not a doctor <laughs> of capitalism. I don't believe in reviving the patient. In fact, I believe if the patient's dying, the best thing you can do is let the thing die, bury it as quick as you can, and dig the dirt and trample the dirt down very hard indeed. Because I don't believe what we need is a nicer form of capitalism. I think we need no capitalism at all, Absolutely. and a form called socialism, a society where we can, everyone can be treated equally. Everyone has a right to a job. Everyone has a right to an house. Everyone has the right to health care, everyone has the right to education. It's really simple, but it seems to me that's a much better system, much better system, much more rational system than the market that we see right now ripping through ordinary people's, 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 people's lives. And therefore it seems to me this, that in any crisis, it's not true that it automatically goes to the left. I think we have to be very, very clear uh, about, uh, 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 about this, that actually we've seen it before in the 30s, we've seen it again in the 70s, when the economy goes into a dip to, I think what really goes on, the centre ground begins to melt, and actually you get, uh, you get really the class of forces pushing to either side. You can see the growth of fascism, and you can see the growth, growth of socialist ideas, and this becomes a race against time. And we have to learn from history that it's not just going to be our time next, Actually, there's other people out there, Nick Griffin from the BNP, the Austrian Nazis, Le Pen in France are also saying the thing, same thing, it's their time next. In fact, the BNP have got a front page of their paper this week which says, crisis, brilliant news, it's our turn next. That's what the BNP are saying right now, and we have to understand that, and therefore we have to understand that the only way, is that if it's a fight, there has to be resistance, there has to be a fight back, to have to pull people away from the ideas of the fight back, of blaming black people, of blaming gays, of blaming women, of blaming Asians, of blaming Muslims. A, a fight against that and a push into the ideas of socialism, the ideas of struggling for everybody, not just for, for a few. And I want to say this about it right, uh, 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 right, right now, is that when you see the world right now, I, think, I don't think it's just one reaction to this crisis. I think in many ways you see one reaction which is a fear. It's not surprising, it's not, no, I don't call it a socialist welcome. The idea of people being made unemployed and fighting for better conditions is not something that socialists go, ah, it's great, it's going to be so bad, we'll all fight back, this is what we want. That's not true at all. We're going to see fear. And people are hurting and they're hurting already and they're going to hurt even more. That's just the reality of, of, of the situation. Seems to me something else though. What you also see is anger and bitterness. Because really right now, if you are an ordinary worker, and you're being told that you have to have a pay cut, then you're not just going to be fearful, you're going to be angry. Why should an MFI worker lose their jobs when thousands of bankers have kept their jobs? These questions are going to keep, keep
coming, coming up. And I think we have to start by saying this. There's a common old view of the 1930s that all the 1930s was, was a period of recession, war and fascism. And that's all true, and if that's all it's going to be, then we might as well go a month for cover. I was going to say go to Iceland, but that's probably not a very good place to go, to, to go anymore, but go somewhere uh, else. But that's not really the thing. And I want to say this. It's also a period of resistance. Also a period of struggle. Cable Street against the fascists, the unemployment workers marches, the revival of trade unions in the late, in the mid the late 1930s, as the boom, as the crisis began to lift, workers began to fight back. <laughs> it's also a period of revolution, the Spanish Revolution, the upheavals in France of the popular front of the popular front, front government, and that is not an objective factor whether people fight or they was or they was, or they resign themselves to their fate. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subjective factor. It's what socialists do, it's what activists do that can make the, make the difference. And I think we have to say this, to anyone who's not in the SWP, or to members of the people who are in the SWP, is the SWP will not just sit back and watch this car crash and watch millions of people's lives destroyed and ruined by the rich and the greedy. We will not do that. We have to take up the free market ears. We have to encourage working class uh, resistance. And I want to say it in, in a different way, because it seems to me that really... I want a, a court of arms. This is what the meeting's really, it's not called a court of arms, we thought that was a bit, now you've got your room, we can say it's a court of arms, you weren't allowed to say that really. I was told, strict instructions, it had to be called something soft, like call to action. I wanted to call it a court of arms, and now I'm in the room, now you're all here, we've locked the doors, it is a court of arms. It is absolutely a court, I've got the guns in the back, don't worry, we've got the guns here. There's nothing to worry about at all, but seriously, it's a call to arms. And what do I mean by that? You see, we have a problem. But when the crisis hits, it's not true that anybody thinks you can fight. There's lots of trade unionists right now talking about the fact that we can't fight because the recession means that people won't fight. But I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that, and I don't think you can just sit there and have an argument. Sometimes you've got to get your hands dirty, you've got to prove it in practice. And I don't know, there's a woman standing there. Stand up, Mary, please. <laughs> Like, people don't know why people are clapping. Mary sat outside the works of pensions, is that right? The no, outside the Royal Courts of Justice. Thank you very much, I'll stand corrected. <laughs> Demanding pensions get their, get their, get their, 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 fuel, their fuel bills. On her own, sitting on chair, the heater there, every single camera on the world was watching her. It makes me proud that Mary's on, so she may be, you're not a spring chicken Mary, you're an old actress, an old fight, and that makes me very proud of you. So anyone that says you can't make a difference, it's not true. One person standing out the, outside the courts got the world's media on them. See, we've got to get active, we've got to get organised, we've got to start fighting. And when you become a Socialist Workers' Party member, that's what we stand for. We're not just, we are for fighting ideologically, we are for selling our papers, we are for agitating in the colleges, taking up the arguments about, about the system. But also, we're an organisation that thinks you have to fight, that working class people change when they struggle, when they resist, and if they resist, they can fight back uh, indeed. I remember speaking to someone who was very, very close to, to uh, a guy called um, Phil Palatin. And he said that he was a, Labour, uh, a Communist Party MP in 1945 in East London, one of the first Communist Party MPs to be elected. And he said for years, the CP would go around the streets saying to people, we need to have a rent strike, we need to occupy our houses, stop the landlords kicking us out of our homes. And people used to say to him, it's a utopian dream, could never happen. <coughs> he then met one family, he said they were willing to resist. They were willing to say they won't leave, they'll fight to defend their home against the, the bailiffs. He said that family stood and fought and their neighbours stood and fought with them and they chased the bailiffs away three times until finally they got a six month remit on their rent and were allowed to stay in their house. And what at that time was regarded as impossible, then after that victory everybody said actually I'm not going to be evicted either. So it seems to me if you make a fight, if you stand and fight, yeah. you might win. If you roll over and die, they kick you out of your house, they sack your job, and they throw you on the streets. And it seems to me that's an old socialist, a socialist thing of doing. And therefore it's quite simple. If it's a call for action, we've got to get moving. And I'm going to invite you to a party on Friday, four o'clock, outside the Bank of England. And we want a party, because we're going to the Bank of England and say, don't bail out the bankers, bail out the ordinary people. Give us the jobs back. Stop the student poverty, uh, no housing repossessions. And we want everybody to be there. We want a militant protest. And people should know what we mean by a militant protest because that's what we want. We want your union banners, we want your whistles, we want your student groups there. We want everyone there at all. We're going to have a meeting the week after on that on the People Before Profit chart. There's cards on your table. We want to make that a big meeting because again we're going to meet another call for arms. We're going to follow it by Halloween night. 
Halloween's a great night. Yeah. Something I never used to celebrate when I was a kid, but it seems to be much more fashionable nowadays. I don't know if people know on the Isle of Dogs, the head, ex headquarters of Lehman Brothers, big Canary Wharf building. It's empty. <laughs> Except even side of it is Barclays Bank and HSBC. We think we should go there on Halloween night. Yeah. And it's good to see that people like Jeremy Corbyn and Tony Benn are putting the call out. The SWP will put the call out. And small group, and, and groups of anti capitalist protesters are going to put the call out. And some trade unions. And on Halloween night, we're going to put the masks on. We're going to get the torches out. And we're going to march there. And we're going to take the building over. And we're going to see what Canary Wolf looks like. And have a little look around. Yeah. And protest and find out what they're going to do. Find out how they spend our money. Find out what they're doing with all our billions of pounds. And then we're going to see what we go from there. And hopefully, we're going to do uh, a couple more things. We're hoping as well that uh, the TUC are going to call a demonstration. There's going to be a motion coming out tomorrow. Call on the TUC to call a demonstration. I think they've already called it for spring. But spring seems like a long, long, long way away for me. And it seems every time we need to do it, we need to do it earlier. So we need resistance. We need resistance on the streets against people being evicted. We need resistance outside the banks, outside the MPs, offices and all the rest of it. But I'll tell you something else. That right now I think we're at a kind of cusp. Whereas I think for the last couple of years in Britain, in the industrial front, We've seen a growth of industrial militancy. I, I, I've told you, maybe I've not told you. I've done the UAF demo in London the other month, and this couple, were, the old couple, they must have been in their 50s, were running to keep up the sound. <laughs> only, only, I'm very young, so I'm very uh, This couple were, um, were um, running along trying to keep up with the van. I got on the van, you see, I'm not silly. Uh, I was sitting on the van. And they said, um, I said, they've, they've got him on the van, and I said, are you alright? He goes, I'm really knackered. I said, just sit down. And his wife goes to him, I love my husband. I said, alright, great, that's really, 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 that's really good. And she said, I said, well, why is that then? And she goes, he's a shell tanker worker. And I said, oh yeah, and he's been on strike. And he's now got £800 a month extra a week for going on strike. Yes. And she went like that, and she kissed him. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, and that is a change of times. I mean, I'd love to get £800 a month extra in my, in my back pocket. But it was a sign of what was going on. When Amanda talked about the bus strikes, when I turned up and picked up, there's 200 people there. You think, my God, I ain't seen a picket line in London with 200 people for a long, 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 long time. I tell you, I went on a teacher's demonstration and I heard the teachers singing, We Shall Overcome. And one other teacher said, I've got I know a song called The Red Flag. I know, he's playing it on his guitar. Now, this, there was a smell, wasn't there? There was a whiff of the return of the working class job, you felt that the pay campaign was beginning to fight people to resist Gordon Brown. That's all true. And I think it's still there. We've got the PCS banner, the National Union teachers, we've got, uh, we've got hopefully a joint action of the INT uh, tube workers and the buses in a couple of weeks' time. All that is there. But I also think, to be perfectly honest, we've hit, we've hit a barrier where what we've also seen in, in Britain as well, I think, is for the last 20, 30 years, the unions take a pound in. And those at the top, many of them, not all of them, but many of those union leaders at the top, are also very fearful of fighting, don't want to upset Labour's other car, think there's only choice between Labour and, and, and the Tories, and are trying to down, down the action. And we have to have a fight. We have to fight in all those years to get the biggest yes votes we can, to support the people on the picket lines, encourage the resistance in the industrial working class, and hope that it takes off and begins to, 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 push, to, to, put, to push on. What I'm trying to say is that wherever there is an argument, you're going to find the SWP, arguing the colleges, in the workplaces, and on our streets. Wherever there's a banker sneaking around, we're going to try and nail them to the floor. Yes. Wherever there's a boss trying to rip workers off, we're going to try and pinpoint them and argue for action against these, these people. Wherever, and I mean this, wherever anyone is evicted from their own, we have to say we are going to defend them and not let them be kicked out on the streets. We cannot have 30, 40, 50, 60,000 people being turfed out of their, of their homes. And I'll say this, and that's the last point I want to end on this. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows. But we do have a compass. We're not directionless right now. We can expect greater instability. We can expect more tensions, more divisions inside our ruling classes, between, even inside the Labour Party and other political parties. We can, and we know, that they are going to try and make and squeeze the poor. There's always a way out of the crisis for the rich and powerful, and that's to make ordinary people, people like me and you, pay for it. Squeeze us until we, squ until we squeal. And they will squeeze us even more if they need if they need. We know they're going to make us try and pay for the crisis, but we also know this. We know there's going to be resistance. We know there's going to be people who say this cannot be the way it's got to be. There are going to be people who say we don't have to put up with this crap anymore. Why should we be forced to bend our knee for one more minute of the day? And the outcome of that resistance will depend, just like it did in the 1930s, 
just like it did in the 1970s and just like it did in the 1980s. And don't believe all the rubbish about the 1980s, it was just a period of defeat. We came close in the 1980s to beat Thatcher. Read her own diaries. Three times she thought about giving in. We just needed to squeeze her just a little bit more and sadly that didn't happen. It was a close run thing. We know there's going to be resistance and the question for us is what we do. What socialists, what activists, what revolutionaries do matter. And therefore our call is for every one of you to do your bit to resist, to do your bit to fight back. We don't make history, everybody makes history. All of us together fighting back is what changes things. We don't need people to do it for ourselves. We have got to start the idea and bring back alive the idea that working people will sort their own problems out. We don't need to rely on Labour, the Tories or the Liberals. We can fight for ourselves and defend ourselves and that is a thing we've got to rebuild, relive and regroup and fight back because I believe this is the worst of the times for them. And if it's the worst of the times for them, it should be the best of the times for us. I want to make three very quick points, and they're quite simple really. The first is about the BNP, because it seems to me that I think the, the people who raised the question about the alternative, the, the alternative could be much, 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 you know, could be, could be fascism, and we've seen it before, and we have to be clear about that. And I want to make... I am using the mic. I want to make a couple of points. Uh, I want to make a couple of points about it. The first is a very... Uh, well, it's a crap book, but it's a very important book. There's one chapter in the book that is worth reading, which is a book on uh, Labour's collapse and uh, the failure of triangulation. And what it states in this book is that really Labour's shift to the middle ground in order to under outdo the Tories has left a huge gap to its left, <coughs> which has left its membership in deep isolation and cut off from its base. And it says the five areas where Labour has seen the biggest fall in membership, and this is it, Stoke, Barkin, Rotherham, Burnley and uh, Leeds. Now think about that for just a minute. Every one of those areas is where the BNP have moved in and began to take, to take seats. Now I'll tell you we have a problem. I was in Stoke yesterday and I have to say it was the most thoroughly depressing meeting I've been to. It's quite a big meeting and it was me and this uh, Labour MP and she got up and it must have been, I don't know, uh, 40, 50 young students there and she said, you know what, I don't know why there's a problem in Stoke. It's such a wonderful city. You look out the window and it's just a desolate wasteland because it's a wonderful city. We have a wonderful partnership scheme. Everybody's happy and it's only a few troublemakers making it bad for the rest of us. And this young Asian kid at the back went bollocks. <laughs> but that was great. But you know what she said to him? It's troublemakers like you that allow the BNP to get in. That's what she said. It's troublemakers like you but, and he went up and just got up and all his mates got up and walked out. Now I'll tell you I have a problem. Because really, if you went back in time, you'd have a simple answer. You want to keep the BNP out, you vote to keep them out. The real problem is, people then turn around and say, who do we vote for? Yeah. And the problem with it is, if you just say vote Labour, it takes you right back to the problem again. And this is a serious problem for the left to face and we have to find a way of dealing with it. And it seems to me we have to have two things. It seems one is this. One, we have to carry out the message of don't vote Nazi and continue to fight for that line. We have to do that. But I'll tell you something else. We have a problem. I'll tell you what, if this recession carries on, if this crisis carries on, we're going to find in Fords, they're going to shut down the last bit of the engine plant. They're already going to close the MFI branch, which is directly in front of Fords, which took 100 jobs from Fords when, it, when they shut the, the trackway down. Now I'll tell you, our answer can no longer just be don't vote Nazi. Our argument has to be in places like Barking and Dagenham and in Rotherham and in Stoke, actually if they can find money to bail out the bankers, they have to find the money for the Forge yeah. plant. Yeah. They have to find the money yeah. for the MFI shop. Because if they ruin those jobs, I tell you what, we will create date wastelands where the BNP will step in and not. We have to fight them both in terms of the BNP on the streets the BNP ideologically, but we also have to start to answer the questions of the crisis because this is what the BNP are feeding off. The failure of labour, the increase in racism and the despair of poverty. And unless we tackle that, then that means, and that means our few comrades in Barking have got to go move on it. 
you've got to resist because if we don't offer resistance the BNP will feed off the pet despair and I think we've got to think about that carefully that affects every single one of us whether it's Camden Hampstead, Tottenham, Southwark, you name it, we can go through it. We'll be all day if we keep naming all the boroughs, so we'll just stop, we'll stop right there, and I think that's important. The second thing is, sometimes it's just a little, you know, a little story, a young person that expresses something so much better than acres and acres of, 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 of text. And about a year, not more than that, maybe two <laughs> years ago, no, a year ago it was, I was invited to speak on behalf of Love Music Hate Racism at this secondary school just on the outskirts of Leeds where two young students came into the class with a BNP rosette on and beat the living daylights out of some poor young Asian kid. It was horrific. And the school did two things. The headmaster invited the police in and the teachers weren't very happy about that and then invited me in to speak afterwards. And I arrived just as the police officer was um, speaking and I was going to wait my turn and I was going to wait until he cleared off. And um, I saw this young girl, I mean she was like 13 or 12 or 13, and she sat there blowing bubblegum while he was speaking, kissing her teeth and tutting. And he turns there and goes, what's your problem? She goes, you are. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? She goes, you kill black people. And he goes, no I don't. He goes, you kill black people. Stephen Lawrence, you let their murderers go. I thought, what a, what a, wonderful, what a wonderful person. Anyway, I talked to the teacher about her. And he just says that she's this real gobby young woman and she's brilliant. He said they had the army in the school last term. The army bloke stands up to speak and she sits there doing the same thing. And apparently she says, puts her hand up, she says, you kill people. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a little pattern emerging here, right? He goes, no. He goes, I don't know how you can say this. He says, no, we don't. <laughs> He says, uh, yeah, you do, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, you're a murderer. The teachers have called him in and said, you've got to calm this down. <laughs> Co-op bank have gone into school this time. They've played for, they play for their school. There's a, like, an indoor playground of, you know, toys and, and stuff, and then tall women and all this. And the co-op bank, and they've come along to open it. And she stands up and she goes, you kill people. <laughs> And the teacher's going, don't be so absurd. They did all right, the army do, all right, the police have killed some people. But the cold bank she goes, yes, they do. When they, don't, when they don't help poor countries feed themselves, they are killing people. And I just thought to myself, actually, if a 12 or, f I'm not sure she's 12 or 13, right, if a young woman can put that kind of argument to the system and understand it, then actually, we've got to make kind of similar arguments right now. It's not a difficult thing, and I think it's very, very important that we don't blind ourselves with panic, because the two things I want to really say from this meeting is this. The first thing is, there's a great famous slogan from the Bolsheviks, which is, we do not teach you, but life itself will. Yeah. And it's an important thing to remember, because for me, I think right now we have to listen to people, and listen to what they're worried about, and help them find a way through their, through their problems. I'll tell you why I say that, is well, I heard the Mayor of New York on the TV, on BBC yesterday, and he talked about, he met Bush, and Bush, and he told Bush what he needed. He needed money for this. He wanted Bush to save the car industry in the local area because this would up down. He would, and Bush obviously, you know, helped him out on that. Seems to me, and it's really an answer to Jess's point. You see, if anyone comes up to us as socialists, I think we have to be two people. We don't mean we fight hard against the system, but we're also the tribunes of the oppressed. And it seems to me quite right, simple. If someone comes up to you, or me, or anyone in the SWP, and say they are going to be evicted, they're going to lose their job, we have a duty, it's our absolute right and our absolute duty to say to that person, resist. Don't let them kick you out of your home. We will stand with you. I will go back to my SWP branch and I will promise you that 10 SWP members will come and stand at your door and send the bailiff away. I promise you that 10 SWP members will come to your factory, your office, and put a leaf in demanding that you fight back and fight back with, with you. We have to do that because right now, it is a question of fear and resistance. And there's a thin line in my a very, very thin line between fighting and cowering. It's always the way you know what it's like when you're at school. You know what it's like at work. You've got to bite your lip, 
and you've got to say, Sod you, I'm going to fight it. But you have to do it with inside yourself. Actually, you need you to, you've got to build yourself up. And if socialists don't do it, don't expect other people to do it. Best thing about a socialist, they're always meant to be the one that stands up at work and tells the boss to get lost. The one that stands up in college and tells the lecturer he's talking crap and offers something. That's what makes you a socialist. We are the ones, the angry brigade in the, in the schools, in the colleges, in the workplaces that offer a way out and people look to in order to fight. Cliff, Tony Cliff, one of the, one of the founders of our organisation, used to say this. There's always, in any struggle, a right-wing worker who never wants to fight, a group in the middle who are nervous, and an angry Bolshevik on the left. The question is, can the angry person on the left pull the people in the middle to the right to fight back? And if we do that, we can begin, uh, begin, begin, to, uh, begin, begin to change. And I want to make this couple of points, really. The first is this. Uh, we're asking people in the SWP, and those not, to make a sharp turn. A sharp turn today. It's not just good enough to come to this meeting and think, wow, what a good meeting or what a shit meeting or whatever. The key thing is to go back tomorrow to your SWP branch and plan what you're going to do. We need to go back to our localities. We need to encourage non-members, other activists to come to our meetings and get organised. There's a great... We are, Agitate and organise has got to be our slogan right, uh, right now. We've got to get people into our branch and direct them. Direct them to the bus picket lines. Direct them to the demonstration on, on, on Friday. Build the resistance. Direct them to the charter meeting. We've got to start to stir the pot and, and begin, to, uh, begin to agitate. Secondly, we have to say this to people. I think the time is now for socialism. I think if you stand up in any corner of the street, any school, any workplace, and put a coherent argument against this system, the rottenness of this system, we can win and adhere to this. It's not a difficult argument. People say to me, oh, socialism sounds so complicated. No, it ain't. It's really, really simple. What we really believe is that working class people make everything that makes this society run, and they get robbed by the rich. It ain't difficult. It's Robin Hood in reverse. That's what it really, really is, uh, quite simply. And we believe that we could organise this world much, much better than they could. I'm sorry, if we were to condense the world into this room and we had someone running it, you then allowed one in every three people in that room to die, allow another third of those people to live in absolute abject poverty and allow another nine-tenths of them to live in, under, below everything else and one percent of them to live the life of luxury, to live the life of wealth and greed and everything else, I think we'd turn around and bash them on the head and throw them out of the room. Actually, that's what should happen in the world. Why should 2% of the world's population earn 90% of the wealth? It's wrong, it's immoral, it's disgusting, it makes me want to puke, and it's got to end. It's a simple argument, and we've got the power to do it. And I don't believe anyone who says that socially all the people can't run their lives. We could do a lot better than Gordon Brown, Richard Branson, the Lehman Brothers, or any other people who run this society and will rob us. Will rob us. Two more, one last point. This. You see, you can't be a socialist on your own. You see, I'll tell you what I think the problem is right now. You feel right now the events are moving so fast, the scale of the crisis is so massive, that if you stand on your own, what can you do? It's like a tidal wave hitting you. And if you just stand there and put your arms out, it'll wash over you and you'll get blown, you'll get blown away. You can sit home and watch the TV and go, God, aren't they terrible? And these bankers, aren't they terrible? And you can sit there and think all these kind of things all the time. But what are you going to do about it? And the truth of it is, and this is the most important thing about this, socialists have never ever achieved anything on their own. Working class people never deliver on their own. That's why we have to build ourselves collectively. That's why if you're going to get a pay rise, you have to be collective about it. Workers come together to fight for their pay rises. If you're going to resist the Nazis, you can't do it on your own. You have to come together to stand in front of them on the streets. If you're going to march to the Bank of England, there's no point in going on your own. We need hundreds of people to go to the bank of England on their own, and therefore you have to be part of an organisation that meets, that discusses and develops the ideas, but also puts them into practice and fights on in the here and now. And I'm going to be on Radio 2 tomorrow. Uh, never been on Radio 2 in my life, I don't even want to play anymore on it. But I was interviewed by this guy and he said, um, he asked me for a sum up thing. I'll, I'll find out in a minute, it's in my diary, I'll continue in a second, right? And he says this to me, this guy, he says, uh, give me a little wrap up for your thing. So I says, uh, you know the truth of it is, they called it Black Monday, they then said it was Terrible Tuesday, Wicked Wednesday, and I think they called it Tough Thursday. Well, to what, what, Friday, the show goes out this Friday, it's going to be called Fight Back Friday. Yeah. Fight Back Friday starts on the picket line for the bus workers and ends outside the Bank of England, and hopefully one of us sitting on the Bank of England manager's chair deciding what we're going to do with all the money in the bank. That's what it's going to be decided about.
and he said, are you really going to make it right back Friday? And I said, yes. And I went out thinking, oh my God. Is it be <laughs> so your strike has got to be, get organised, get the posters out, get the leaflets out, raise it at your workplace, raise it with your colleagues, doesn't matter if you've got no union there, raise it with your fellow workers, people want to come, raise it at your college, raise it in your classes, let's make sure Friday sees 7,000 work bus workers bring the buses to a standstill. Let's see hundreds of people outside the Bank of England with our placards saying, jump you bastards, it's the best thing you could possibly do. Because we need Fight Back Friday and we need to follow it by Fight Back Monday, whatever it's going to be, munch them up Monday, tear them away Tuesday and whatever. Thanks a lot and make sure you join the SWP.